Hello, my classmates. This is Mr. McKeever to you coming from his wonderful, humble abode here. It is currently uh, November 4th. That's right. It is Wednesday, November 4th. And we're going to talk another, go through another wonderful physics lesson with you guys. Um, I wish you guys all the best of luck today on your um, anatomy exam. If you have already taken and now you're listening out, well, I hope you did well. If not, I know that and have faith and trust that you guys studied well enough for that exam and you're going to do just fine. So we're going to talk about second and third laws of Newton's today. So that's where we're going to start. Uh, make sure I am recording. I am recording. So we'll talk about the second law of motion and how force relates to it. Talk about third law of motion, which includes stuff like impulses, momentum, and conservation of momentum, which we'll find out is very much similar to the conservation of energy and conservation of matter. <clears throat> so Newton's second law states that the acceleration produced by a net force on the object is directly proportional to the magnitude of the net force in the same direction to the net force and is inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Wow, that's a mouthful, right? describes a relationship among objects mass and object acceleration, the net force on an object. The acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. If the net force acting on the object doubles, the acceleration doubles. If the mass is doubled, then the acceleration will be halved. If both the net force and the mass are doubled, the acceleration will be unchanged. So this is looking at a formula where this, where we have consistent units, newtons for force, kilograms for mass, and meters per second squared for acceleration. So we have A is acceleration, F is net force, M is mass, right? You'll see things, it's typically written in physics as acceleration equals net force over mass, or A equals capital F over M. To me, that always didn't make much sense. So it's much easier for me to have it written out force equals mass times acceleration, right? And when I did that, and the, the, the reason I did it that way, if you look at it, right, all I did was multiply both sides by an M, right? So I put an M over here, I put an M over there, and that just made it a lot simpler of a formula for me. It, you know, you don't have to do it that way. You're free to use A equals F over M if you want. You have to understand it doesn't really matter at that point. I just find that it's a lot easier to be able to do my equations in my head if I get rid of a division, right? Division just divides us. I'd rather multiply, right? So that just always made more sense to me. And I've always taught it that way when I taught physics is to make that formula be F equals MA, right? FAMA is the way a lot of people remember it. Force equals mass times acceleration. That means in order to solve any problem for me for that, I'm gonna have to either give you the force, the mass, the force and the mass, the mass and the acceleration, the acceleration and the force. I have to give you two of the variables, right? But if there's ever a question that's talking about the way that force is enacted upon an object with acceleration or mass, this is the formula you're going to use. So if we have a car that's accelerating at two meters per second squared, what kind of acceleration can it attain if it's towing another car of equal mass? Right? Well, if it doubles the mass, it's got to have the force. Right, so that's kind of there. It's got to double, have the acceleration. That's the thing, because if it doesn't, then it doesn't equate out. Just F equals MA makes things a lot easier to figure out. So let's look at some examples here real quick, right? So force equals mass times acceleration. I said that just because it's easier to do proportional math that way. It's all about making the math easier. If force goes up, then either the mass or acceleration has to go up. Or both, you could increase both do it, but the idea is to make the formula equivalent, right? If I take two, two F, that means something on the right side of the equation has to get a two beside it, right? It's just simple math. Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. That means these equations, when I set them this way, are proportional, right? When we go back here, right? That mass is inversely, technically the mass is inversely proportional to the acceleration, meaning that the heavier the object, the harder it's going to be to accelerate it. And we, we actually understand that, right? We know that from looking at cars and tractor trailer trucks and all the big stuff like that, tanks, right? And we know that if we make something smaller, right, it makes it easier, you know, either the force is going to be halved, acceleration is going to be increased. 
So that's kind of the way we look at this. It just makes things a lot easier to look at. So let's look here. We've got a car that has a mass of 1,000 kilograms and accelerating at 2 meters per second squared. What's the net force? This would be a simple equation. You just plug the 1,000 kilograms in for the mass. You plug the acceleration in, 2 meters per second. And you end up with 2,000 newtons of force, right? Don't forget the newtons. If I put that on a question and it just says 2,000, 2,000 is wrong. You have to have the units. Don't let me trick you. Don't get paid is what I'm saying. Well, what happens if we double the mass of the car? So now we've doubled the mass. The mass is now 2,000 kilograms. Kept the acceleration the same. The force doubles. What happens if we, instead of doubling the mass, we double the acceleration? Right? So instead of doubling that mass, now we have a, a 1,000 kilogram car right? going at 4 meters per second squared. Same thing's going to happen. We're still going to get this 4,000 newtons. So what would it take to get the original 1,000 kilogram car to go 10 to, with 10,000 newtons of force? Well, we just plug those in inversely, right? So we have we know that we have 10,000 newtons. We know what the weight of the car is. We have 1,000 kilograms. And we're looking for the acceleration. Divide both sides by 1,000. And that's going to leave us an acceleration of 10 meters per second squared. Right, so that you can see that increase in the force of an object being enact upon it, you've got to either modify that mass, right, or you've got to modify the speed. That's how these numbers are proportional. It's just a simple math equation. What you do to one side of the equation, you got to do to the other, right? If I would want to say, you know, what happens if, you know, we know that so a thousand kilogram car at two meters per second is two thousand kilo two thousand newtons, right? What happens if I make the car a hundred times heavier? Well, the force is going to be a hundred times more effective, right? So again, whatever I do to one side, I've got to do to the other. So how much force or thrust would be needed to accelerate a jet that weighs about 30,000 kilograms in order to achieve one and a half meters per second squared? So we're just going to plug them in, F equals MA, right? So we have 30. 30,000 kilograms, we have 1.5 meters per second. It's going to take 45,000 newtons of force, which is quite a bit of force to get it going at something as simple as one and a half meters per second, right? The heavier the object, the more it's going to take to get moving. Well, think about that. I mean, let's think of somebody that's got a, uh, you know, again, I like watching the shows like the, uh, the Street Outlaws and stuff like that. If you want to get down that drag strip faster, you can do two things. You can lighten your car, or you can increase the force that you put out of the car, increase its horsepower, right? Either of those will get you down that drag strip faster. You can also shorten the drag strip if you were talking about just totally getting down it, right? But either of those will actually get you down it faster. The more powerful the car, the easier it is to get going. And you can even take that to the point that it would get almost uncomfortable for acceleration, right? Do you ever see like any of the shows where they have the um, planes taking off from the aircraft carrier and they use the catapult slingshot? And you see those pilots when they take off, if they're not braced in their seat, it flings them backwards, right? They're pulling some Gs. Well, that's all based upon how much force is being acted upon it to accelerate the object, right? So second law. Third law states that whenever an object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first object. Oh god, that one's um, fun, right? The first force is called the action force, the other force is called the reaction force. Neither force exists without the other. If there's no action force, there is no reaction force. If there's no reaction force, there's no action force. They're equal in strength and opposite in directions, right? So they're equivalent in strength and you know inverse in directions. And they always occur at the same time. It's not like you have an action force, there's a delay and then there's a reaction force. 
the third law is often stated for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, right? And that's true in this world, right? Something good happens, there's usually something bad that happens somewhere else. Um, you know, you it doesn't matter which force we call the action, which one we call the reaction, they just are equal and opposite of each other. So for example, you push against the floor, the floor simultaneously is pushing up against you, right? Technically, even gravity, right? Gravity is you pulling you down, so therefore the floor is pushing you up. That's technically a perfect example of Newton's law, right? As long as the floor is solid and patent. Tires of car interact with the road and produce the car's motion. As they push against the road, the road simultaneously pushes back against the tires. Again, going back to the whole drag strip idea. If you have stickier tires that push harder onto the road, your car goes down the road better because the road pushes back on you better, right? When swimming, you push the water backwards and the water pushes you forwards, right? A, a good swimmer will use all its possible forward momentum to get speed out of that swim, right? And so using that water to move you. What if you have water that's already moving? Are you gonna go faster? Like if you're swimming down the river? Yeah, right, because the river's already pushing on you. Now you're gonna push further and the river's gonna push harder back on you. So you're gonna go faster down the river, right? These all interactions do depend upon friction though, right? A person trying to walk on ice where friction is minimal may not be able to exert an action against the force of ice. And you see this, right? If you try to walk out on the ice and especially if you had something like slippers or with no traction on, you're gonna end up falling on your butt, right? If you've ever gone to a hockey game where they do the, uh, like when they bring out the guests of honor or they do something at halftime, one of the first things they usually do is roll a carpet out across that ice. And the purpose of that carpet is so they don't get sued from somebody falling on the ice, right? And if you ever see them where they do stuff where they actually put people like your average ordinary person on skates, it's usually a disaster because they don't know how to walk on the ice with skates unless they've actually skated before in their past, right? But then if that's the case, how come those hockey players can get moving down the ice so well? Well, those skates are sharp, right? If you ever look at the, that's why they have to bring out the Zamboni every now and then, right? Because those skates cut divots into that ice and they can even shave ice. You've seen them pe snow people when they slide across this ice, right? But without an action force, there can't be a reaction force, right? So there'd be no forward motion. If you just stand there and kind of really slippery shoes and try to walk on ice, you'll just stand there and kind of spin in circles and they fall on your butt. When you get on a boat or off of a boat and move onto a dock, as you move forward onto the dock, the boat moves backwards. It's an excellent example of this, right? The dock, the, especially if the boat's not moored to the dock or tethered, you'll actually push that boat away from the dock. So, you know, that's, that's a great example of it. There's also the theory that when a dog wags its tail, the tail wags the dog. Right, so the dog's wagging its tail. If you watch a dog, especially when they're really excited, right, and they get that tail going, then all the body starts going along with it, right? So when the dog wags the tail, the tail wags the dog. You know, like we talk about it, kind of an extreme thought about this is something as small as a butterfly, where this obscure chaos theory comes into play, right? The butterfly effect. The theory that states that something as small as a butterfly flapping its wings can stir up a tornado somewhere else. Right? Throwing a stone into an ocean could theoretically cause a tsunami somewhere else in the world. It's a little far-fetched, right? And it, I know it's a kind of theoretical idea of physics. That's why it's called chaos theory, right? But in reality, it's just using Newton's third law of motion, that you did a force and there's a reactive force somewhere else. And these concepts can even lend, lead into things like potential motion machines or perpetual motion machines, right? Everyone's seen that little thing down in the corner there with the two ball, the three balls where you bang one of them do, 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 and they have them in psychologist's office all too frequently. And I think it's to make people neurotic. I don't think it's there for any other reason. And every single psychologist I know, and I've, I've got a degree in psychology, has one of those stupid perpetual ball machines on their desk. I, I really think it's to make their patients neurotic. I have no other reason why it wouldn't be there, right? To, that sound is not even relaxing to me. But if friction didn't exist and no energy, you know, you had perfect collisions with those balls, as one came down, it would strike the other, it would send the other one up, and it would just go on forever, right? We know that friction exists in this universe, and there is things called elastic collisions we're going to talk about where some force is given off as energy. Um, 
but that's kind of where we're leaning with this. I mean, again, this goes back to this whole idea of if we can ever get perpetual motion going, we could have free energy. That could be huge. We again, I'm going to say this: we break dependence on things like you know natural gas, oil, stuff like that. I know that. Oh God, I don't want to talk about the election that's going on right now, but I know that you know we always talk about oh we're going to lose so many jobs. Well, yeah, but we're also not going to pollute the planet and we can get other jobs for those people. Let's, let's put them into something that's better like solar or wind, right? Um, but you know, the perpetual motion, we can never come up with an idea for this. It definitely would change our whole world, right? So it's harder to stop when we're talking about momentum now. So momentum comes off of that idea of for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? With momentum, it's harder to stop a large truck than a small car. Even when both are moving at the same speed, the truck just has more momentum in the car. And by momentum, we literally mean kind of dynamic equilibrium inertia, right? The inability to change its motion, the inertia and, inertia and motion. Moving object can have a large momentum if it has a large mass, high speed, or both, right? Momentum is the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. So momentum equals mv. Um, when direction is not important, remember velocity makes speed into a vector, right? You know, we don't need direction. We can also just say that mass times speed equals momentum as well. But just momentum times m equals mv usually helps you make sense out of this. But a moving truck would have more momentum than a car in the same speed. A fast car can have more momentum than a slow truck, right? A truck at rest has no momentum at all. Let's look at an example here, right? Toyota Corolla has about 1,275 kilogram mass. A Mack truck with a trailer attached is about 36,500 kilograms. The truck is 28 times heavier than the Corolla. That means for the Corolla to have the same momentum, it would have to be traveling 28 times faster than the truck, right? So let's just say for whatever reason, they're both going 100 miles an hour. In order for that Corolla to match the momentum of that truck, you'd actually have to have the Corolla going 2,800 miles per hour which it wouldn't happen, right? But when you think about that for a second, right? So if a truck is going one mile an hour, it has the same momentum as a Corolla going 28 miles an hour. Think about that for a second. That just shows you the, what we have to do, right? And then you have the truck going downhill, right? It's gonna have more momentum than a roller skate with the same speed. Even if they're going at the exact same speed, right? That truck's got more momentum because it's got more mass. Now, if the truck's at rest and the roller skate moves, well, then the skate has more momentum because it actually has velocity. Because even if we have 3,600 kilograms, if it's at zero meters per second squared, it's not going anywhere. It has no momentum, right? That whole idea of, you know, nobody, you know, nobody truly moves a parked car, right? In order to move a car, it has to be moving. You can't exactly move a parked car. Um, same idea here. If a roller skate rolls by that parked car, well, that roller skate's got more momentum than the parked car because the roller skate is still moving. So if the momentum of an object changed, either the mass or the velocity, or both changes, right? The greater the force acting upon the object, the greater the change in velocity, and the greater the change in momentum. The change in momentum depends on the force that acts and the length of it, and we call this an impulse. A force sustained for a long time produces more change in momentum than it does for a force applied briefly. So both force and time are important in change in momentum. Say you got a car that's stuck in the mud or here in the desert, maybe stuck in the sand, who knows? If you just walk up to that car and just real quickly like, you your all push and you push for a second, that car is probably not gonna move anywhere, right? But now you give it your all and you push against that car for a good minute. Yeah, the car may actually be able to dig itself out because you've imparted a longer impulse, right? It's there for a longer period of time. You're trying to change its, its change in momentum for a long period of time, which makes it a lot more likely to have that momentum changed. So both force and time are important. Well, how could I, let's say I only kept that one second rule. I'm only pushing that car for a second. The only way I'm gonna get it unstuck is if I push really hard, right? Suddenly I become Superman, right? But you know, that's going to require a lot of work on my part. A little bit less work on my part would be pushing for a sustained amount for a long period of time, right? 
And so the quantity of force on time is called an impulse. An impulse is how much you're changing the momentum, right? So force times time equals change in momentum, change in mass and velocity, right? So the greater the long time you exert on something, the greater the change in momentum, the greater the force, the greater the change in momentum will be. If we change the mass of an object, it would require greater force or greater time to change its momentum, right? The easiest way to change the momentum of an object is apply the greatest force possible for as long as possible. So a great example of that, the space shuttle taken off, right? That space shuttle is huge. Um, I'm not sure how much the whole space shuttle weighs along with all of its thrusters and everything else like that, right? But it's pretty heavy. In order to change its momentum from zero to getting into the outer space, it requires a great amount of force. And that force usually lasts for a long period of time, right? Those that you have three stage boosters that are on the, right? You have the, you have the rockets that are actually on the space shuttle. You have the two outers and you have the one center. And so as it goes up, it's providing that force, that spaceship and their space shuttle. And as it gets more and more and more and more, it's making that space shuttle go faster and faster and faster. And it's applying for a longer time, which is easier to change as momentum at that point. Well, how could you less the amount of force? Well, I could either increase the time that that force is applied over or shrink down the object or make it go slower. Any of those would change, right? But if I have an object that is, you know, half the size, in order to get the same change in momentum, I need half the impulse in order to get the same change in momentum, right? So a golfer team against a a ball or a baseball player trying to hit a home run, we do the same thing. If any of you have ever played golf or baseball, I'm sure you've done one of those. I understand they both involve hitting a little tiny white ball. Um, I'm not good at either of them. I do go golfing every now and then with some of the docs I know, and I am pretty much there for comedic humor because I am really bad at golf, right? But I've had a couple lessons and baseball, I tried out for a long time ago and I got my batting coach and all that fun stuff. And one of the things I remember from my batting coach is it's great if you have a lot of strength to hit the ball. There are some players that hit the ball with a ton of force, but they never hit home runs. And then there are those that have a moderate amount of force that get home runs consistently. And what's the difference? The difference is how long that bat rides the ball. Right? How long are they able to maintain that bat in contact with the ball? The longer they can maintain that bat in contact with the ball, the greater the amount of impulse it's applying to it, the greater the amount of change in momentum they're giving that ball, and it usually can go farther and faster, right? So that's kind of the idea here. Golfing's the same way. If you want to really hit a good long drive, right, you need a nice, um, I don't want to say golf puck, that was what I was trying to say, golf club, right? Golf club with a large head on it that you can impart the most amount of force over a long period of time, so it kind of cups. And if you look the way those golf clubs are shaped, they're kind of shaped to form a cup, aren't they? So when they hit that ball, the ball kind of gets sucked in there and then the ball will go with it and you follow through with the swing, right? If you just want to get a little putt, you just tap the ball. If you want to drive it across the green, you've got to ride through it. And the forces involved usually vary from instant to instant. A golf club that strikes a golf bar exerts zero force in the ball until it meets it, right? As you're swinging through that golf club, you're not doing anything to the ball until that club hits that ball. Now you've imparted a force. The force will increase rapidly at first and the ball will become distorted. Then the force will diminish as the ball comes up to speed and returns to its own shape and flies off. And we can use average force as a solve for these impulses, right? Here's kind of a slow motion capture of what it looks like when a ball, uh, golf ball is being hit by the same club. If you look, when that golf ball gets hit, depending upon the speed, the shape of the ball is definitely different. At 175 miles an hour, that's a pretty potent swing, right? But look how distorted that is compared to something down here at 130. It's a lot different shape, right? That's just looking at somebody implying it. Now, I can do, so let's say I'm hitting at 175 and 120. Well, how can I impart the same momentum to the one down here at 120? Well, I can ride the ball longer, Right? If I hit that 175, but only tap it a little bit, I'm not going to impart as much force as if I ride the ball out longer. And again, you can see that's kind of the idea of that being cupped there to change the shape of the ball. So let's say you're driving in a car and you lose control. 
platform, right? And you had to choose between hitting a haystack on your right or a concrete wall on the left. Why did you choose the haystack? A lot of people say, well, because it's softer. There's something to that, right? Physics helps you understand why hitting that's going to be better, right? Because the change of momentum in that haystack is going to occur over a longer period of time. And that means the force of your impact is lessened. Right? If the change of momentum, if you go from 60 miles an hour to zero in a second versus 60 miles an hour to zero for five seconds, that force is a lot different, right? You know, think about if I don't know if any of you ever gotten in an accident, but I've had a couple times where I've gotten in accidents. Um, usually, it's and actually all the times it's somebody else's fault. But you, you think about it, right? If you're relaxed and you don't know that accident's coming, the force on your body is lessened because you go with the actual accident, right? The worst thing that can happen is if you hear that car coming up behind you and you tense up. Right, and you knot up all your body because all of a sudden you're ready for that. You're like, I'm ready. This is the best thing I can possibly do. And what happens is now all that force gets jammed in at a rapid force to your body. And that's usually when you get more injured, right? Has anyone ever seen the stories of the guy that there uh, just a few years ago, actually, it was out, I want to say it was out in my county, the guy that was doing skydiving and hit his head on the way out. I wasn't, it was in Indiana. I don't remember, him, but hit his head on the way out of the plane and never deployed his parachute, but lived. Well, why did he live? Well, because when he landed, his body was so ragdoll because it was unconscious that literally he exerted that force of landing over a large period of time, right? Um, you know, that's just kind of the idea here. The longer you can ride that force out, the less overall force is gonna hit you, right? But if you slam into that concrete wall, wham, well, all of a sudden, that hurts, right? Doesn't matter when you hit the wall or the haystack, come to a stop, the momentum's increased by the same impulse. You're still going from 60 to zero. That hasn't changed, right? But the same doesn't mean the same amount of force has an active because your time is different. That means the same product of force and time is still occurring. We keep forces small, we can extend time, right? If we need to shorten time, we're gonna increase the force, right? May the force be with you. So we talked about back here, right? That force time ratio. So think about a large tractor trailer truck again, right? I don't know why I keep going about this. I guess because my father was a tractor trailer truck driver for a while. And it's going down the path from Las Vegas to California, I believe, right? Pass is about 1151 meters high. And on average, the grade on I-15 is about two, two and a half percent, three percent grade. Doesn't seem like a lot of grade, right? That, I mean, definitely doesn't seem like a very good grade in your school if you get a two and a half percent. Going downhill, that's that's a pretty significant grade, right? Now you add the semi trucks. Now you have thirty six hundred or thirty six thousand kilograms coming down that grade. Who boy, that can add up to some speed really quick. And now what happens? The brake systems fail because it happens. My dad's been in a track trailer truck with a brake system fail, that they didn't check the specific air brake lines and they only have Jake brake, which we'll talk about that when we get into engines and stuff like that. Right? Well, now they've got to stop. Well, how do you fix it? Right? How do you how do you get the truck to stop? Well, you have to make a way the truck to slow down that doesn't involve using a cars. Now, absolutely, truck trailer truck could do that. Bang off the guardrail, bang off the car, bang off the, and keep hitting a few amounts of force over time, it'll eventually slow down, right? Or maybe hit a car and have the car use its brakes to slow you down, right? That didn't work so well in, I think, what was, what was the speed? I think, what, oh no, what was the movie about the train with Chris Pine? There's a movie about that that was set in Pennsylvania too, Unstoppable, I think, or something like that, right? Where they try to hitch up a train and try to slow it down, right? Well, how else can we do it? Well, they develop runaway ramps, right? There's one of the runaway ramps right there um, going down that pass, right? What does that runaway ramp do? Well, if you look at them, they're long periods of kind of bunny hills. And the object is to slow the truck down slower and slower rather than just slowing that truck down instantly to a stop, which isn't going to happen at that on a force, right? 36,000 kilograms of moving, that's going, right? Force equals MA. 
figure that out. If they're going 55 miles an hour, that's a lot of force coming down that track, right? And that's why a lot of times when you come down those, right, there's a warning sign that says trucks use lower gear 25 miles per hour. Because they know even at 25 miles per hour, that truck's got a lot of force behind it. Okay, figure this out. You're going down at, you know, because we have that. Let's, let's just look at this real quick when we think about it. Force equals MA, right? Let's see. Um, two. Give me one second. I'm trying to convert miles per hour into meters per second. Meters per hour to meters per second. So let's say we're we're gonna go 55. So at 55. We're going about 24 meters per second for a truck going 25. They're going about 11. So let's just say we're half. So we do one's doing 11, one's doing um, 22. Let's just go that way. So here we have our curl, and we'll just say the curl is 2,000 kilograms. Going 20 meters per second, right? So now we've got how much? We've got an extra zero. So we got 40,000 Newtons of force. Let's change that now. So now we've got the 30, so let's just go with 36,000. We're gonna take out that 500, make it easier. And it's going at 10 Newtons of force or 10 meters per second, right? Now we have 360,000 Newtons. Yeah, I'd say that truck's going at a significantly different pace with force wise, right? It's gonna take a lot more to stop it, right? Well, that's why those runaway ramps are there. It's why also, if you look at the brakes on trucks versus the brakes on cars, it's a big difference. Um, you know, again, I'm into modifying, I've been into modifying cars, modifying trucks, stuff like that. One of the things I did to my truck was I put bigger brakes on it. Why did I put bigger brakes on it? Well, that way when I'm hauling a larger load in the truck, it's easier for me to stop. Right? When I came out here to Las Vegas a long time ago and land far, far away, I came through the Continental Divide over there by Flagstaff, and I was towing one of those big old, uh, the biggest U-Haul trailers you can get. And I'm going to be honest, it was my first time ever towing a trailer. I've used my truck for hauling and stuff like that. I've never towed a trailer behind it. And so, you know, coming across that Continental Divide, I had my motorcycle in the bed of the truck, plus that full bed, that full trailer, and I get to the park coming down that divide and that was actually scary. I can't say I've ever actually, you know, I wasn't even going around corners that much. It was just scary because the weight in the back of that truck was so hard to control. Even though the trailer had brakes, my truck had brakes, it was still difficult because all of a sudden that force behind me, whew, that was bad. And any little change in my momentum drastically affected the way things were going, right? That impulse changed drastically. Now, in order to get me up to speed, it also took a lot greater force or that force applied over a greater time in order to get me going. So I had to get used to that too, right? The truck didn't take off as fast as it used to take off, right? But in this case, we're talking about going the reverse to slow down that or lessen that force. So when you extend the time, you reduce the force. Padded dashboards are a great example. If you go back and you look at some of the cars from the 50s and 60s, their dashboards are metal. You know, you think about some of those cars, some of those old cars are gorgeous. I, I would kill for a 57 Chevy or a, like a Pontiac GTO Judge. I would love a Judge, honestly. That would probably be my car of choice if I could get one right now. But those cars were not made safety-wise, right? You hit that dashboard, you're going unconscious. I remember my, um, my mom had a 56 Chevy Nomad wagon and the dash was all steel. I remember the accident we got into it that totaled it. I remember as a kid, I got thrown up against that dash. And I, cause why? Because back then we didn't wear seatbelts because why wear seatbelts? Why did you do that, right? Man, that hurt. I was hurting for a couple of weeks after that and I was a kid. So we added airbags, right? Airbags design is to slow down your forward momentum as you're being pushed forward. The downside to that is sometimes the airbag comes out too fast like when the car settlements. And so then instead of slowing down going that way you're speeding up going that way and you just defeated the purpose, right? 
to catch fast moving ball, let's see if you got a catcher, right? The catcher comes out and he's got his hand out like this. He catches it and rides the ball in. He doesn't just hold his hand out there, right? Why? Well, if you're in the major leagues, get somebody pitching a ball at 100 miles an hour. That ball hits your hand, it's going to hurt just a little bit, right? So it kind of rides it out. When you jump down to the ground, right? It's jumping off of a high location, jump down to the ground. You have two, two options. You can keep your knees straight and end up with meniscal problems, or you can bend your knees when your feet make contact to the ground and extend the amount of time it takes you to change that force. The higher up you jump, the longer you want to kind of decrease that force, right? So you want to kind of slow it down as much as possible. Having really good functional quads and hamstrings can help that out as well. It's the point of an eccentric muscle. An eccentric muscle in your body's job is to slow down that contact force. And we'll talk about that in stuff like kinesiology when we talk about a foot feet coming down at a heel strike when you're walking, you hit down on that heel and your foot begins to slowly come down, right? It's slowing down the force and spreading that force of contact out across your whole foot. A wrestler, when they're thrown to the floor, extends his time of hitting the mat by spreading the impulse into a series of smaller ones, right? You'll, they do what's called break falling, where they spread that fall out across their whole body rather than just landing on my elbow, right? One of the most common injuries that occur in people, right? So I'm sure Dr. Johnson's talked to you guys already about what's the most broken bone. Most broken bone is collarbone in the human body, right? But what's the most common bone broken in falls? The most common bone broken in falls is what's called a foosh, a fall on outstretched hands, where your hands are out like this and you break the scaphoid just the small bone in your hand, right? Well, not small, it's one of the bigger bones in your hand, but you get the point, it's still a small bone. Scapoid fractures are really common. Scapoid fractures can lead also to radial fractures or called a collies fracture, where the collies is, will fracture that radius and it'll go backwards. That can all happen from a foosh, F-O-O-S-H, fall on outstretched hands. Well, how could you keep yourself from breaking those? Well, what if when you fall, instead of just having your arms out straight, you ride the fall out? That can actually decrease the overall impulse or force in your hands. The other thing you do when we teach it in the martial arts is instead of falling like this, you land on your side and you slap down as you're going down. Then you're spreading that whole force out along a larger area of your body and it still hurts. It just doesn't hurt as much. It hurts me now a lot more than it hurt me back, you know, when I was you guys' age or younger than that, because I could take a fall, you know, you look at kids, kids fall down, bam, you're like, oh God, that would break our neck. They're right back up and running in five minutes, right? So there's ways that you can do it. And you look at the um, professional wrestling, I call it, or as I call it, the man soap operas, right? Like WWE. When they do stuff like stuff off the upper turnbuckle and laying down, watch the mat as they land, because the mat flexes. Right? And the object of that flex is to increase the amount of time they can ride that force out. Right? It's almost the same idea as a net beneath a person on the high wire act. Right? It's to slow them down so they don't get injured as much. In the martial arts, we talk about this a lot. Training you to roll with the blow, roll with the blows to reduce the impact impulse. Right? So there are a couple of different ways you can reduce force. You can move with the punch or what's called rolling. So if somebody's striking me, if I get hit in the face, which I don't like to get hit in the face, I've had way too many blows to the head, right? I have two options. I can, or actually three options. I can sit there and take it, suck it up, buttercup. I can, well, the, the third option there is I can close the distance quickly and get in on them. Well, at that point, I'm not going to decrease or not going to reduce the overall force by riding it out or increasing the time it hits. I'm just going to try to decrease the velocity coming at me. So if I can get in closer, if they can't get as much wind up to get me, right? And we all know the people that fight in the real life, right? Their wind ups are way back here, right? Martial artists, if you ever watch them fight, their wind ups are really quick and short, right? Boom, boom. The object is to generate as much force with as little motion as possible because that way you can't get out of the way of it. Right? But if I see that coming, I see that punch coming, what I can do is as that punch strikes me, I can roll with it. And because I'm increasing the time that punch is striking me, I'm actually decreasing the force that that punch has, right? And do the same thing when you take body blows, right? You let your stomach absorb the blow 
And some people teach, oh, hold your belly nice and tight. Just take it that way. Man, that hurts. I used to do that with my kids' martial arts all the time. I'd let them beat on my stomach. And you go home and you're like, okay, that, that wasn't the smartest idea in the world, right? And then you get up in the ranks and you realize it's probably not the best idea, but if I kind of roll with it and I keep my stomachs a little bit soft, enough firm on the back end that it's not breaking anything underneath, but soft enough that it's going to ride it out a little bit, you decrease the impact momentum. And that can really kind of save you, especially if you ever do full, con I did semi-professional full contact for a while. And it, it wasn't if you were going to hit, you were going to get hit. The object was, how did you take that hit? Right? Were you able to take it and not get knocked out? Because getting knocked out was a real, you know, real thing. But let's say that you back. You, let's go back to the car idea again, right? You're back in the car idea. You don't have a seatbelt because maybe the car doesn't have seatbelts. You have a steel dash and you hit a concrete wall. Pretty much say goodbye to you, right? The whole idea of cars in general, right? We now have crumple zones on cars. When the car hits something, it kind of crumples up. That increases the time of the impact that decreases the force on the body. Watch something like either NASCAR or watch, um, watch I'm gonna use NASCAR because NASCAR is something I'm really familiar with. I guess say IndyCar too, right? We'll talk about that in a second. We'll watch NASCAR. When a car starts getting you into a wreck, if you watch, there are flaps that fly up all over the car, right? What those flaps do is increase the surface area of the car. By increasing the surface area, it slows the car down, which is slowing down that impact. Right. The other thing the cars have is all kinds of crumple areas that just kind of roll up on them. Right. The, the outside is just sheet metal. There's not much to it. Right. So it hits the wall at 190 miles an hour. You go, man, if I did that in a regular car, I'd be dead. Yeah, you probably would be. And they don't have airbags. Well, how do they survive those things? Well, it's because of the way the cars are designed. The cars are designed to self destruct. Indy cars are the best example of it. Get a chance, Google the worst Indy car wrecks. Um, there was one, I think it was Castro Neves a few years ago, where he actually ended up into the fencing at Indianapolis. And the car just literally shredded to pieces. And you're like, how did this person survive? And he got right out of the cockpit and I think he was dizzy and kind of dazed, but walked away from it. Um, just last year, I'll, I'll see if I can find the video of it to post. Um, actually, this year, I'm sorry, not last year. This year at Daytona, there was an accident with Ryan Newman who was in like third or fourth place for the race at the Daytona 500. And, you know, he got into a really bad accident. Now he wasn't as lucky. He, and he said he tensed up in the accident. One of the things they try to teach them is don't tense up in an accident like that. It causes more problems than, it does, than help. And, you know, try telling somebody that when you know that you're going to go end over end in your car, right? Don't tense up. Yeah, that's going to work out. So he said he tensed up and he ended up with some really, really bad traumatic brain injuries. I think he also had a broken leg for a while. Um, came back into the race after the COVID thing and everyone was really amazed. He even got back in a car. Um, Dale Earnhardt, uh, probably one of the NASCAR's biggest, one of the biggest people ever in NASCAR, right? Love him or hate him, he's still one of the most talked about people in NASCAR. You know, he died driving a car. He actually died protecting his son's lead at the Daytona 500. Right. But why did he die? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, he hit the wall at 197 miles an hour. Okay. That'll definitely do some damage to you. Right. But also he wasn't a big believer in all the new NASCAR safety systems, right? NASCAR has got all kinds of new safety systems built into their cars, built into the car itself in the cockpit in order to keep the driver safe. One of them is a full face helmet. Well, why do you want a full face helmet? It's to keep their faces pretty, right? No, it's actually to so that if they end up hitting their face on something, again, it reduces the impact. Motorcycles have the same thing, right? Why I don't understand why anyone would ride a motorcycle with an open face helmet or with no helmet. That's just stupid. Bikes, same way even. Um, but he didn't like those open face helmets. He also didn't like the thing that they have now called the Hans device, the head and neck restraint system. If you ever see a NASCAR driver get out, when they get out, they have this big device that looks like almost Philadelphia color around them. That's the Hans device. And what that does is they get when they get in, it locks them into their seat so that when they get in an accident like that, it keeps them upright and their body's not flailing all around. He didn't have that. So he hit the wall, you know, in a fairly older stock car, honestly, because that was, you know, a while ago. 
at 190 miles an hour without safety systems, of course he's going to die, right? That's just kind of the way it was. That year we lost him. We also lost Adam Petty from similar things. NASCAR started looking at safety things. Now they've got the stuff called safety, safer barriers. And if you go up to the NASCAR track up here in Las Vegas, they used to do a whole safety tour up there. I don't know if they do it now, but they would take you around the track and show you what they've done to improve the safety of the track. And it's, the stuff is amazing. On top of changing the grip of the track so the cars are more likely to stay on the track, right? They've developed this thing called a safer barrier. And again, I know I'm geeking out about NASCAR, but it does have a physics meaning here. So the safer barrier, what they've done is instead of just having one concrete wall, which is what happened at Daytona, is what they, Dale Earnhardt hit, and it's what Adam Penny hit at New Hampshire. The walls now have some space between them. So there's a couple layers of wall. And in between those layers of wall, there's foam and some of the tracks, there's even water, um, not water buckets, but like water bladders in there. So then when you hit those at high speeds, right, the wall itself has a crumple zone and it takes longer before you get back to the hard wall behind it. The hard wall is still there. It just has an extra kind of layer of protection. It's almost like an ogre, it's got layers or an onion, one of the two. That's kind of the idea here is if you can decrease that. Um, it, you know, it's, it's the whole idea if you're going down and you need to, you know, get in a wreck, do you want to hit a tree or do you want to run through a bunch of bushes? Run through a bunch of bushes. You might hit a tree eventually, but the bushes are going to slow you down. Um, I can actually speak from experience. <laughs> Funny story about that. I used to pull cars for one of the largest auto auctions on the East Coast. And if you're not familiar with what pulling cars are at auto auctions, you know, when they buy a car at the auto auction, a lot of times they'll be shipped by a shipper. So a big truck, trail truck carries to wherever it's getting delivered. We used to ship a lot to New York. And these cars that we pulled aren't always the best. Um, I remember flipping one of the headlights up in one of the cars and fish falling out of it. I remember getting into one and it still being soaking wet that it was in a lake or a pond or I have no idea what it was in. But this one car I got into, it was a beautiful Jaguar XJ8R. Uh, gorgeous car. Oh, just beautiful. Interior, immaculate. Why did somebody trade this car in? Um, British racing green, nice tan leather interior, like digital dashes before those digital dashes were cool. And to get out of the auto auction, you went over to a gate, you checked out, and then right, bus right across from the gate is US 30. And you had to go under 30 to get to the truck lot. So they built this tunnel that went down at a really steep angle at the bottom and just come back up. And a lot of cars, when you went down to the bottom, went bottom out. A lot of cars, not just the Jaguar. But took my car out of there, and you know, Jaguar's got a little bit of beef, so I had to get used to not spin it up as much as I could, right? But I started going down the hill, and I hit the bottom, and all of a sudden, the engine just roared to life. And I didn't realize what I was in for, but all of a sudden, the throttle stuck at wide open throttle. And so... I went from going downhill, hitting that, having the bump, to going uphill like a missile. And I know that when I crested the hill on the other side, I was already at 75 miles an hour. And I, it, it brakes didn't matter because I was airborne at that point, but I was stomping on the brakes pretty good, pulling up on the e-brake. Nothing was working. The e-brake actually broke. Um, so I had to think to myself, how do I stop this car? I had two options. I could turn right and go into the exotics lot and just plow through a bunch of exotics or turn left. I'm sorry. That's the left. Left. Yeah. Um, that wasn't going to be an option. I didn't want to do that. So then I looked to my right and my right, I remember there was up this really steep hill. And then I remembered, oh, wait, on the other side of that is about a 60 foot drop. Ah, that's probably not a good idea, but there's fencing in front of me. So, and I'm not, uh, this is how quickly this processed in my head. I'm like, I'm going to run through the fencing and I'm just going to plow through every single pence, pen, uh, pence pole, fence pole I can. And I remember just driving down and ping, 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 they're just bouncing off the front of the car. And I was swerving up the hill and swerving back down, trying to get to slow down. Finally, I got my foot up and I kicked the car in a neutral and blew the engine. Um, kept sliding through this, well, do, 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 stepped on the brakes until I spun out. And I ended up going through the fence and parking dead between two Lamborghinis. Never touched the cars. Funny story, ironically enough. But from then on, I've never stepped foot in a Jaguar again. <laughs> um, I consider them cursed vehicles and I'll never get in one. But, you know, I, I, 
I didn't think about it back then because this, you know, this was eons ago. This was probably when I was 17 or 18. I can't remember what. Um, but uh, in that method, I used physics, right? I was decreasing that impulse by using the fence to slow me down. Funny story, right? If a boxer, again, can make contact five times longer by riding the punch, how much will the force be reduced by? Well, it'll be reduced by five times, right? We increase the time by five, so it'll reduce the force by five. It's kind of the idea there. Breaking bricks in the martial arts. I keep talking about the martial arts because it's my, you know, been part of my life since I was six years old. Breaking bricks in the martial arts, a common test to achieve ranks, right? When a practitioner imparts a large impact to the force for a short period of time, it produces a considerable amount of force. Your hand bounces back though, yielding as much as twice the impulse that you impart to the bricks. And you, it's not, not very uncommon for somebody that's breaking a huge stack of bricks to end up with a broken bone, right? Just because the force that is. And if you look here, this, this brick, when you're looking at the way this is set up, right, there's a reason why they're set up this way. If you look between each of these bricks, there's these little extra bricks. Those are called spacers. Those spacers are specifically design, designed so that you don't shatter your hand. If you stack all those bricks up on top of each other, you've now got this one surface that you're imparting all that force on and it's usually not gonna break as well. Where with those spacers, you're riding the force down through a lot better. Um, interesting story about martial arts. If you ever watch somebody break, right? The way this person's breaking the bricks is breaking them with power because the, bri the bricks are breaking downward in a V. If you ever see somebody that's really good at the martial arts and actually breaks with speed, what you'll see is they'll have this, but then the rest of them will come up and cone up because it'll actually go backwards with the hand as it comes up. Just interesting story. And that's just kind of, that's that whole, for a reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If I pull back while I'm doing it, it actually comes back with me. Still breaks, it's just kind of an interesting way to watch it if you ever get a chance to. Um, glass dish is more likely to survive as a dropped on carpet rather than a sidewalk, right? Carpet has more give. You think about it like when well, you have an olive garden or red lobster, why do they all have carpet if it's so hard to keep carpet clean with food? Well, it's that way so that when somebody drops a dish, it doesn't automatically break, right? And also reduces the sound in the area too, right? It kind of deadens sounds when there's a thousand people in an olive garden that you're not all drowned out with noise. Again, same idea because the carpet slows down the actual speed. So it actually works the same way. Um, since the longer time hitting the carpet, the smaller force results. A shorter time hitting the sidewalks, greater stopping force, it breaks. Safety nets used by circus acrobats, same idea, right? If they didn't have that safety net and they're just hitting the ground, the person's probably gonna splat, right? But that net allows them to slow down as they're coming down. The safety net reduces the stopping force and therefore can actually substantially reduce the chance of injury. It doesn't always stop it but it reduces the chance of injury. Let's say you catch a falling pot with your hands, right? You're gonna provide an impulse to reduce the momentum of the zero. So you catch it and you actually slow it down to zero. If you throw the pot back upwards, you have to provide an additional impulse, right? The impulse to bring the object to a stop and then throw it back again is gonna be greater than the impulse only to stop it. That makes sense, right? It's gonna require more for me to catch it and throw it back than it is just to catch it. If a flower pot falls from a top shelf and hits you on the head, you may be in trouble. If it bounces from your head, you're probably in more trouble because the impulses are greater. So if it comes down and shatters over your head, you're probably better because that's going to spread that force over a longer period of time. You're going to survive. Piano falls, you know, we always see those cartoons where pianos hang dangling and falls down on the person. If it falls straight down, the person bounces on them, right? Probably going to die. I'm just going to say it. Right? But if some, for some reason that just kind of shatters over top of them and they wake up, they come to and they're standing in the middle of the piano, the reason they probably lived is because it was spread over a larger period of time and the impulse was lessened. So conservation momentum comes into play here, right? Force or impulse that change the momentum must be exerted on the object by something outside the object. Uh, molecular forces in the basketball have no effect on the momentum of basketball, right? Even with the basketball, if you got it in your hands here, right? There are energy inside that basketball. The atoms of air are moving around. The actual molecules of the basketball are functionally moving, but the basketball is not actually moving. It's no effect on the basketball, right? It would take you to get the basketball and move it to impart a force on it. Push against the dashboard from the inside of a car doesn't change the momentum, right? This is a big thing. My ex-mother-in-law is still all the time with me. 
stomping down on the passenger floor doesn't slow the car down. This is not Flintstones, folks, right? Just like pushing against the car inside the car is not going to make it go faster. Those are internal forces. They come in balanced pairs to cancel each other out. When you push against the dash, dash pushes back against you. Conservation is there. So law of conservation of momentum states, in an absence of an external force, the momentum of a system remains unchanged. So the momentum before firing this cannon is zero. And I'm glad I've got pictures now because you just have to ask the other class about my drawing this. It was not a pretty sight. After firing, the momentum is still zero because the momentum of the cannon is equal and opposite to the momentum of the cannonball, right? So if you shoot this cannonball forward, blam, right? The cannon actually is going to go backwards at an equal pace, right? Now, we, we talked about that, right? The impulse is going to be what? What's that? Force times time equals change of momentum, right? But the change of momentum is momentum is mv. So they're going to be the same on either side of this cannon. Well, let's just say this cannonball is a one kilogram cannonball, right? And I don't know, we'll say this is 1,000 kilograms over here for the weight of the, the actual um, cannon. There we go. That's what I'm looking for, the cannon. Well, the thing is, is if we have velocity here and we have velocity here, in order for this to be equal, this velocity is going to degrade uh, highly less than this velocity. That's why the cannonball goes flying off and the cannon doesn't move because the weight of the cannon is going to affect it. The other thing that affects it is this beautiful little plug back here, right? The foot, the brace, because that's digging into the ground. That doesn't like go anywhere either. And that actually affects it because of friction and stuff like that. But the momentum, both before firing and after firing is the same, right? It's going to equal out to be zero because they're both going opposite directions. Forcing the cannonball inside the barrel is equal and opposite to the force causing the cannon to recoil. Um, guns, when you shoot them, right? I don't know if any of you ever gone shooting, right? They recoil. The action and reaction forces are internal to the system, so they don't change the momentum of the system. Before the firing, the momentum is zero. After the firing, the net momentum is still zero. Net momentum is either, neither gain nor lost, right? If you ever want to see some funny videos, again, firing guns, go look at some people firing either the Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifle or the Barrett 50 caliber hand cannon or not, the Desert Eagle 50s, right? Those guns have a ton of momentum on their projectile being fired from them. Well, as that's shooting out that way, there's an equal and opposite force going back this way. And I love it when you see people that are like single handed the Desert Eagle and they're like, blam, and that gun goes right back up into their forehead. And then they end up with a nice print up here that says like DE, um, where it has the, the hammer in their forehead. They usually get a split. Same thing with the Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifle, right? It's not the same as shooting your dad's 22 long rifle. Uh, we'll see if I can find a video of it. It's kind of funny. But a lot of people, when you see them shooting it, they get down here and they get their face and they're not blocking well enough. And so they've got give and they fire that Barrett 50 and the gun comes back and all of a sudden they've got a kiss right around their eye from the scope of the Barrett, right? You got to brace them. There's equal amount. Now there are all kinds of compensators you can put into guns, right, to avoid that. Uh, if you've ever seen a gun with a chamber compensator, it actually allows some of that force to disperse out the sides of the chamber, right, muzzle, flare, and stuff like that to allow it to go out that way rather than coming back, and that reduces the kick. Um, one of the things we had when I was growing up was called magnaporting the gun. If I can find my rifle, it's somewhere in my house here, the one that I magnaported, I'll take it out and take some pictures of it, but in the tip of the barrel, there are little slivers cut. And what those slivers do is allow some of that force, instead of going backwards against me, to kind of go out. And I have a 300 Weatherby gun, which is a pretty potent rifle. And when that gun kicks, it kicks like a mule. Even with that magnifying, it still kicks like a mule. And you've got to have some strength to hold it against you, because otherwise you're going to have a bruised shoulder all day long, right? And just funny to watch somebody that's never fired a gun and thinks they're all you know, Billy badass, and they go out to the gun range, they fire a gun for the first time and poof, smack themselves in the face with the gun, right? I love it when people shoot the guns like this. This is my favorite. Blam, blam, right? 
Well, because they think that the force is going to go like this, but the force really goes like this, and they end up with the wrist injury because of it. Now, you can stabilize, I guess. I don't know why you'd want to shoot like that anyway, but that's beside the point. Um, but anyway, yeah. So net momentum's not being gained or lost. It's going to go somewhere, usually into their face. Momentum has both direction and magnitude. Therefore, it's a vector quantity, right? The cannonball gains momentum, and the recoiling cannon gains momentum in the opposite direction. The cannon cannonball system gains none because they're equal and opposite of each other. The momentum of the cannonball and the cannon are equal and opposite in magnitude and opposite in direction. The cannonball is going forward, cannon's going backwards. No net force acts upon the system, so there's no net impulse in the force. That means in that case, MV equals MV in that case, which I just did a little bit ago, right? The momentum of a system cannot change unless acted upon by an external force. Now, what would happen if you would be pushing on the cannon while firing the cannonball? That could change the external force, not by much, but theoretically it could, right? Um, they've got to calculate that when there are the tanks firing, right? You don't see tanks firing while it's moving very often because it's not very accurate because the, even when that tank cannon fires, the, can, the tank's going to move backwards slightly and that can throw off their shot. Whereas if they get stopped, they can take that into account with vectors and sh you know, shooting trajectory and stuff like that. But when any quantity of physics is not changed, we say it's conserved, right? So same thing, the momentum of the system before is the same as the momentum of the system after and less acted upon by an external force. It describes the conservation of momentum in a system. If a system undergoes change, wherein all forces are internal, the net momentum of the system before and after the event are the same. So a example of is an at atomic nuclei undergoing radioactive decay, cars colliding, stars exploding, anything of that like. And whenever objects collide in the absence of external forces, the net momentum of the objects before and after it equals the net momentum of the objects before and after the collision, right? The collision of the objects clearly shows the conservation of momentum. When a moving billiard ball collides head on head with another ball at rest, the first ball will come to rest and the second ball moves away with an equal velocity, right? That's the kind of idea of breaking balls in um, pool, right? When you hit the cue ball, the idea is the cue ball is going to stop, the other ball is going to move on. Kind of the whole goal of billiards, and this, right? You don't want the cue ball going into the pocket because then you scratch. You want the cue ball to be able to stop and the other ball to go into the pocket. Momentum is transferred from the first ball to the second, right? So when you have the net momentum, that ball going five meters per second forward, when it impacts the other ball, that other ball should move off at five meters per second, right? So when objects collide without being permanently deformed and without generating heat, the collision is completely called an elastic collision. Colliding objects bounce perfectly in a perfect elastic collision. The sum of the momentum vector is the same before and after each collision. So a moving ball strikes a ball at rest. Here we got a pitcher to go with this. The two balls collide head on, bam, right? The one ball stops, the other ball moves on with the full force, right? So if we say that this ball is moving forward at one, when it gets to here, it's still at one and it's gonna go to zero. And then this ball is gonna move off at one. Here we have two balls moving together at each other. Let's say they both come together at one, right? Now they impact each other. They're both going to move off at a different speed. They're going to both move off at double their speed. Right here, we have two balls coming together and collecting. This one slows down. This one over here is going to gain the equal momentum. Say this is going at two and this is going at one. When they collide, now this one's going at one. Now this one's going to go at two because it gained a little bit of momentum from the before and after. This is perfectly elastic collisions. Elastic collisions don't always happen because there is friction. Right? There's friction, there's heat generated. When these two balls collide, there's going to be some heat. If you actually watch them on a thermal imaging camera, you can see the heat generated. So when the objects become distorted and generate heat from the collision, it's usually inelastic. Momentum conservation still holds true here, even in elastic collisions, because what happens is they become tangled or coupled together, right? and you have that inelastic collision. So that energy that you lost by moving it forward gets changed into an equal amount of other energy, heat energy. Right? It just gets, it doesn't disappear, it just changes form. We're going to talk about that a lot when we talk about energy, where energy can't be created nor destroyed, it just changes form. It's kind of like a transformer. 
in an inelastic collision between two freight cars. The momentum of the freight car on the left is shared with the freight car on the right. So here we have freight cars in the same weight class. So we'll just call them both one weight, right? So just say they're one kilogram each, one kilogram. This one's coming in at four meters per second. When these become two kilograms, because they're combined, they'll move off at half the speed the first car was traveling at because that's what's gonna happen. They'll actually move off a little bit slower because some of it will be given off as heat. The initial momentum is shared by both cars without loss or gain. In that case, the momentum is conserved. If there's external forces at that point, they may be negligible because usually trains are well maintained, the tracks are pretty smooth, stuff like that. The friction loss is gonna be less. There's still gonna be a little bit of loss of heat from those couplers connecting, right? Um, external forces may have an effect on that collision. Billiard balls encounter friction on the table, right? Those tables have that felt cloth. They're designed for the balls to have a little bit of grip so you can do different tricks with them. But in the process, that, that cloth actually causes things to slow down. My setup here that I have that I, maybe I'll sh show you guys someday. The setup that I have here, I have a nice soft surface here in the middle of my desk for what I, you know, when I lean my arms on, stuff like that. But my mouse mat itself, my mouse mat is hard. And why is that? Because that reduces my friction when I'm flicking my mouse, when I'm playing games. It allows me to do quicker aim and stuff like that. I don't like soft mouse mats. I've never really liked soft mouse mats. I prefer the reduced friction overall. And even my mouse has really, really kind of fancy, fancy um, low friction surface in the bottom of the mouse to help it. Two trucks collide. The combined wreckage slides on the pavement and friction decreases as it changes its momentum, right? Two space vehicles docking in orbit have the same net momentum before and just after contact. When the space shuttle comes up to dock with the US of the ISS, the International Space Station, the ISS is spinning. So that space shuttle has to match the spin of that sp the, the space, space station so that when it docks, it doesn't suddenly cause the space station to go faster, right? And for a moment when it docks, the space station gains mass and therefore slows down. So they have to adjust it, right? Because there's no air resistance, it's only changed by gravity. Like I said, perfectly elastic collisions aren't very common in the everyday world. Drop a ball and after it bounces from the floor, put the ball on the floor a bit warmer. At the microscopic level, however, perfectly elastic collisions are commonplace, right? Electrically charged particles bounce off one another without generating heat. And they really even don't even touch in the most classic sense of the world. When you see those electrons, that's why the, they repel each other, right? They get close, but they push each other apart. So they never actually impact. But the energy stays the same. So here we have a six kilogram fish that's swimming towards and swallows two kilogram fish. So a big fish come along and swimming, swimming and eat Nemo. If the larger fish swims at one meter per second, what's the velocity immediately after lunch? Well, momentum is going to be conserved from before lunch and then after lunch, right? So in a brief interval, the water resistance doesn't have to, we're not gonna talk about that, we're not gonna count that in at this point, right? So here comes the fish, right? So we got a six kilogram fish moving at one meter per second, a fish moving at, a fish that's two kilograms moving at zero meters per second. What's it gonna be afterwards, right? Well, we have, when we do the math out here, so this is our momentum before, this is our momentum after, right? So at this point, we'll have an eight kilogram fish moving at something. So that fish is actually gonna end up moving at only about three quarters of a meter per second. So it's gonna slow down. And that makes sense, right? I don't know if you have, any of you were track runners or anything like that, but you typically didn't wanna eat right before our race. At least that's what I heard from people that were track runners. I don't exactly look like I'm the biggest track runner in the world, do I? Um, but if you eat before a race, you increase your overall mass, which takes a little bit more energy than to run, but you may want to, if you're doing something like a long distance run or something to that effect. But in this case, because the fish got fatter, he got slower. And we understand that at Thanksgiving, right? It's coming up here in a couple of weeks, mm, Thanksgiving. Yes. But with Thanksgiving, when you eat stuff, you slow down, right? You get slow down to the point that you almost take a nap. So momentum vectors, I think this is the last kind of topic for this. Momentum vector is conserved even when interacting objects don't move along in the same straight line. Here we have cars kind of getting in an accident, right? You have a car moving north and you have a car moving east. When they impact, right? So when you have car A 
I'm going to carb and let's just say these cars are the same weight, same speed, everything like that. If they impact right here, their resulting vector is going to be up like this. We learned about that when adding vectors together. They're going to slide off to the northeast, right? But at the same time, the momentum of the cars is going to be combined. So even if they're traveling at the same speeds, right, the combined momentum after is going to be the combination of the momentum of both A and B together. So momentum of A is directed to the east, and B is directed to the north. The momentum are equal in magnitude after colliding. The combined momentum will be in the northeast direction with the square root of two times the momentum of each vehicle. And that's just because we've got that lovely um, Pythagorean theorem, which comes into play there. You don't have to necessarily know that it's going to be the square root of two. That's not something that's going to come up. But if I asked you if you've got a car going to the north and a car going to the east, we talked about this before when we were talking about combining vectors, right? Which direction is the vector going to go? It's going to go off into up to the northeast. So just a review of the laws. Newton's first law is the law of inertia. Object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an external force, right? Newton's second law of motion, the law of acceleration. When a net force acts upon an object, the object will accelerate. The acceleration is directly proportional to the net force and inversely proportional to the mass. FMA, F equals MA, right? Newton's third law of motion, the law of action and reaction. Whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first object. Um, I don't know what happened to my little, I had a nice speedy ball here. I don't know what I did with it. Anyway, I was going to use that as an example. I don't know where I went to. Um, but what it's saying is when I bang two objects together, as these two fists come together, right, this fist is exacting a force on this fist, this fist is exacting a force on this fist, but they're also enacting forces back on each other. Right? When you push against the wall, the wall pushes back against you. When you push against the boat, right, the boat's going to push back against you. So in PT, we use a variety of devices to reduce the overall effect of friction. One of these is a sliding board. Right? It helps a clinician slide, transfer, and transfer them and control the mass while moving them from one place to another. I mean, yeah, sure, we can just pick the person up and throw them over. But number one, it's not functional. It's never going to teach the patient any independence. But number two, it's also a lot of weight, especially if you get somebody that's at 400, 500 pounds. It takes a lot of force to move somebody that big. And then when you get that force going, it takes a lot to slow it down to sit them back down. Here we can use a sliding board and kind of take the force incrementally to get them over. Works really well. Rebounders, right? Rebounders have to use medicine balls. We have one here, it's pictured at the bottom. It just looks like a mini trampoline, right? And they're used a lot of times in shoulder therapy or hand therapy. So the men of the ball bouncing off the rebounder is meant by the person's ability to catch and stop the ball. If you just hold your hand out there, man, that ball's gonna hit and it's gonna hurt. That's why you got that kind of rebound. Same thing with the rebounder. When you throw the ball at the rebounder, the rebounder stretches backwards and then exerts an equal and opposite force backwards to throw that ball back at you. It requires a whole combination of everything. It's also upper extremity control, whole body balance, everything to that effect. And especially if you're doing something like cryotherapy which will, or cryokinetics, which we'll get into next semester, where maybe you've got ice on the patient's shoulder, it really affects their proprioception when they're doing it. So again, whole list of assessment questions here on this lesson. I'm not gonna go through each and every one of them, but they're there for your review for your quiz. So I'm gonna stop sharing here now. Let's escape, let me stop sharing. All right, so that's it for this lesson. Again, if you're watching this before your anatomy test, I hope you do well on the anatomy test. If you're watching it after your anatomy test, I hope you did well on the anatomy test. Um, if there are any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, if, you, if you have, I'm getting ready to respond to them right now. So bear with me. You'll have a response shortly. Other than that, this is Mr. McKeever. I'm signing off. Y'all have a great day.